Hello, everybody. Welcome to the, to the International Praxis of Function Spaces. It's with great pleasure that I can introduce our today's speaker, Glenn Bienheide from Friedrich Schiller University in Vienna. Uh, it's usually the other way around. People in Vienna are introducing people from Prague in Vienna. So <laughs> I'm happy it could be done the other way around today, sort of. And the topic of today is space approximation. So, Glenn, if you. So, thank you for the opportunity to give a talk in this very nice seminar, which is hopefully one of the very good um, takeover from uh, this difficult two years. Um, hmm? Hey. So, the, the work I will speak about today is together with um, two colleagues from Ruhr University of Bochum, namely Janina Hübner and Markus Weimar. Let me start with a little motivation of um, at least function spaces we deal with from some quantum mechanic or quantum chemistry point of view. So in quantum chemistry, there is this electronic Schrödinger equation describing the quantum state of some atom or molecule. Um, important part of this is this Hamilton operator, which we have here on, above, on the top. This operator is an operator that operates on so-called wave functions, which consists of n variables, where any variable is, of, is, a, is a three dimensional vector itself. It consists of this Laplace, Laplace operator uh, acting to the ice variable. We have some interaction of our electrons where, so these variables of our wave function are the positions of the electrons. And this position interacts with um, the charge or at least with the position of the nuclei. And additionally, we have some interaction between the electrons itself. Interesting in the theory are so-called time independent states or invariant states, which means the eigenfunctions of this Hamilton operator. But before, if we have a look on this wave functions, then we see that um, due to this fact that any position uh, is of dimension three, we have um, an increasing complexity with an increasing number of electrons of the atom or mo molecule we consider. So in case of the hydrogen atom, the whole thing is okay. So then we have only one electron. We can hope for some, let's say, analytic solution of this electronic Schroeder equation. But for example, in case of molybdenum, we have um, 42 electrons, meaning our wave function has dimension 126, and there is no hope for any analytic solution. So um, we have to do approximation theory in some sense to approximate something. And as we know from approximation theory, um, regularity is always interesting to get nice approximation. And Isarentant proved in several works um, that eigenfunctions for the negative spectrum of um, this electronic Schrödinger equation, they fulfill a so-called mixed weak derivative property. So meaning that if we square measure the Fourier transform of our wave function, then we can put such a tensor weight, here a product weight in front of it, and additionally an isotropic weight can integrate the whole thing in L2, and we see it's finite, meaning we have some so-called mixed derivative bounded, and additionally here such an isotropic derivative. I will show you on the next slide, I will go into more detail, or we will transfer this problem to more classical function spaces. Um, so, let us speak about Zobolev spaces. And we um, speak about isotropic and dominating mixed ones. So we deal with functions for the first moment living on RD, multivariate functions. We have two parameters, namely the smoothness parameter R and the integrability parameter P. 
And then for dimension two and some integer smoothness r, we can define the, the isotropic Zobolev space of smoothness r as all that functions belong to LP that have the property that their weak derivatives of differentiating r times to the first direction is an LP and additionally r times to the second direction is an LP. If we speak about dominating mixed smoothness, then we have additionally a mixed derivative bounded. So we have all the derivatives bounded, which we have from the, from the, in the isotropic one. And here we have additionally this derivative bounded where we differentiate simultaneously r times to the first direction and r times to the second direction. In case that we want to speak about higher, smooth, uh, higher mm, dimension of the underlying domain, then the whole thing becomes a little bit more complicated. So then we have to require boundedness of all that derivative where we have an enumeration or where we have any enumeration of R's derivative to direction on and off and taking any combination of this should be bounded in LP. So this quantity should be bounded. Okay. Let me mention some names um, which were historically well around with the introduction of the spaces, Amanov, the book of Nikolsky. In, in terms of what the Jena school is doing, there was in 87 a book of Triebel and Schmeisser, to the spaces, and in our days there are many more references um, dealing with approximation theory of the spaces and properties. Okay. Let us look at um, some approximation theory point of view to the spaces. The point is always in some sense the dependence on the underlying dimension of the domain where this function space is defined on. So the space of dominating mixed smoothness has this property that it needs r bigger than 1 over p for the continuous embedding into the uh, continuous functions. Whereas um, classical isotropic Sobolev spaces, they require, so there this condition depends on P, on D. So there we have R bigger D over P. So we need, and for this point, uh, there's no that dimension dependence in this. Secondly, we consider approximation numbers. Approximation numbers can be understand. So X and Y are Banner spaces where X is um, compactly embedded into Y. Then um, the nth approximation number can be understand as approximating functions F from the unit ball of X by algorithms linear algorithms having this form, meaning they are a linear combination of n um, fixed linear functionals, so which are fixed for the whole class of functions, um, multiplied with some re representation from, from, y, uh, from some representant from y, and measure this error in y. You can also interpret this as um, approximating the identity from X to Y and operator norm by some finite rank operator whose rank smaller or equal to N, this is simply the same. Okay, and then if we look at this approximation numbers, then um, one knows for classical isotropic Zobolev spaces that um, one can bound the Nth approximation number asymptotically, so uh, with constants independent of n, surely, by n to the power r over d minus a half. Here we measure l and l infinity, and we get this rate. If we, so um, actually, I don't know what is the or original reference to this result. Um, Due to the fact Professor Edmonds is in the audience, I know there is some joint paper with Professor Triebel where different of this uh, uh, embeddings were considered, but probably in the East there were even 
earlier uh, results concerning this, but then not on unit cube, then probably on torus or something like this. Um, for the space of, so of dominating mixed smoothness for the Zobolev space, Temlyakov could prove in 193 that there we have, if we measure the arrow in L infinity and our functions come from this um, Sobolev space with mixed smoothness where R is sufficiently large, then we have a rate of n to the power minus R minus a half multiplied with some logarithmic term. So, meaning we have for this mixed spaces a main rate in the convergence rate like it is in the univariate situation of uh, the isotropic case and we pay only a price in some slowly increasing logarithmic term that depends on the dimension of the underlying domain we consider. So um, sure we have uh, this uh, similarity means there are constants. These constants can depend on d, but this rate, this exponents um, of n, they are independent of d. So what does it mean? It means we have here um, a reduced uh, or a much weaker dependence of the asymptotic rate on the dimension of the underlying domain. Let me mention on this point um, two surveys dealing with approximation theory of this mixed smoothness basis. The first one was just recently in 2018, simply called hyperbolic cross approximation by uh, Dindung, Volodya Temlyakov, and Tino Ulrich. And secondly, already in 93, there was um, this approximation of periodic functions by Temlyakov, which, yeah, deal uh, with approximation theory in the periodic sense in a sense for mixed spaces. Okay. I told you what is what are the spaces for integer smoothness. Now we I want to introduce them for fractional smoothness. Actually, the, the details are not that important, but what you should keep in mind is in the end there is some, different, some difference between the resolution of unity for isotropic spaces and for dominating mixed smoothness. So we start with a system of infinitely differentiable, integrable, uh, inf sorry, differentiable, compactly supported functions on RD. We force that um, the, the, the zeros function has support in minus one, one to the D. The J's functions for J being bigger than zero, they are supported in this kind of dyadic analyse. We assume that um, we can bound um, the alpha's derivative together with such a factor as over the supremum norm of this um, for any fixed alpha. And we have the property where the name comes from, resolution of unity. If we fix some point in Rd, then and sum up all these functions, then they sum up to one. So now for fraction order mixed Sobolev spaces, we take such a univariate resolution of unity. So the things from the last page, but with d equals one, and we tensorize it in this way. So this psi here is now a vector and um, any single variable of this vector goes to one of this resolution of unity functions. Then we obtain a so-called hyperbolic little bit Paley building block. So, which means take the Fourier transform of some function or distribution f and cut out this, smoothly cut out this portion generate uh, from the support of the, building, of the resolution of unity and in the end take the inverse Fourier transform. So this here is now the tensorized resolution of unity. And this allows us using little Paley theory for p between one and infinity and any positive r to introduce Sobolev spaces 
with fractional smoothness by simply square sum the little Paley building block together with this kind of product weight. So this one norm, due to the fact that we sum up here only positive vectors, uh, has some product st structure. And uh, finally, integrate the whole thing in LP gives us a norm or, or a way to define fractional order Zobolev spaces. Here is a picture of the decomposition of the Fourier plane in a two-dimensional case. So meaning all this uh, information of the Fourier transform, which is inside one, uh, this, this block, this block here with number five, five, they get the same weight and are so belong to this delta phi five, five and finally they are measured here in in this norm and this is done for the sum over all j and afterwards measured so okay you have such type of decomposition of the Fourier plane in case of isotropic Sobolev spaces we do it a little bit different here we really take uh Derariate resolution of unity. So, um, two slides before we defined everything for RD, and now we take uh, such a resolution of unity where every single function is a derariate function. We go the same way, but now k is only an integer. So, this generates you the dyadic annually, and we cut out the Fourier transform on dyadic annulus and take, in the end, the inverse Fourier transform. Now, uh, looks for, uh, looking in some sense similar to the first one, but with some difference in detail. Now we take again this building blocks, square sum it, but now only over the integers, not over divariate integers, and putting this kind of rate in front, uh, square and uh, take a P norm gives us a, no, a way to describe a norm for the Zobolev space, for the isotropic Zobolev space. Um, exactly. Uh, sorry, this theta here is too much. It's in the sprint. Okay. And here, look to the picture. It means we put um, the Fourier plane into this kind of dyadic annulus and they are weighted. Before we had this rectangle, this uh, hyperbolic rectangular decomposition, and now we have here this dyadic analysis. Okay, keep in mind there is a difference between resolution of unity for, uni uh, for isotropic and for mixed spaces. As I already mentioned in connection with this uh, high dimensions for this electronic Schrödinger equation, um, one cannot always hope for an analytic solution for PDE, so sometimes one has to do numerics to get solutions. And here, let's have a look on this for elliptic PDEs. We want to speak about Galerkin methods or Galerkin discretization of PDEs. Um, using weak formulations, so um, partial... Uh, partial differentiation and so on allows us to interpret this second, uh, second order elliptic PDEs um, by such a linear form. And we assume that our linear form uh, fulfills these two conditions. And we can state our equation in weak formulation as AU equals F of V. So V is our space of test functions, which is the space of um, of functions uh, belonging to L2 having first order weak derivatives bounded in L2 and vanishing outside of the considered domain and the considered domain is uh, nice in some sense. F is from the dual space. Then we are interested in solving this problem and Galerkin means or Galerkin discretization means we are interested in um, finding a solution for a discretized problem of this. So, meaning we take only a finite dimensional subspace of this space here and look for a solution of this 
equation in this finite dimensional subspace. So where we test this equation with functions from this finite dimensional subspace. The Lux-Micron theorem says that both problems have unique solutions. And now the key point is there is in the theory the so-called Shares Lemma. And Shares Lemma is saying that the solution from the original weak formulation of the, uh, of the problem um, differs from this approximation, approximated solution only by a constant times the best approximation of the original solution from uh, the Galerkin subspace. So from this finite dimensional Galerkin subspace. And the point is this difference. So the, the difference between original solution and approximated solution is measured in this kind of H1 space, which is an energy space, a space with first order isotropic derivatives. And this is for today is somehow the motivation to consider approximation theory where we measure errors in isotropic Sobolev spaces. So classic approximation theory, you very often had a spaces where you measure error, L2, LP, L infinity, whatever. And we are interested in also measuring the error in terms of isotropic derivatives. So this quantity we have here, if we look on the right hand side and we would consider this kind of inequality, let's say for the worst you become belonging to some function space, then this quantity here can be understand as um, an optimal M dimension finding or the problem we, ha we have to evaluate the right hand side can be understand as finding uh, an optimal M dimensional subspace in term of approximation numbers or in terms of so-called Kolmogorov numbers. So if we look on this problem, so where we want to measure errors in um, isotropic Sobolev spaces and where the functions we want to approximate come from Sobolev spaces with dominating mixed smoothness, then we obtain that there is no ordinary literature dealing with these problems away from Hilbert space setting. So where, so where source and target space has in some sense Hilbert space structure. There are only a few results, so I will mention on the next slide. What is what a, a question that is much better studied in literature in literature of, uh, in the 2000 plus years was optimality for so-called energy sparse grid sampling, meaning um, is you remember the definition of approximation numbers? There we, we had a problem. We wanted to approximate um, functions f belonging to Sobolev space by algorithms which were linear combinations of some uh, linear functionals here. And if we restrict this class of linear functionals to function evaluations, then we are in case of the so-called sampling numbers. And the question which is very well studied is um, this question of um, when is um, this quantity as good as approximation number? So, but let me mention in some kind of historical timeline what results are known. So beginning in the early 2000 years by Kriebe, Knapek and Bungertz, um, they obtained that um, with so-called energy sparse sampling, one can prove for functions belonging to the unit ball of a mixed smoothness space where derivatives are measured in L2 and we have um, bounded mixed derivatives of order two. And we measure in a space which considers first, deriv first weak derivatives in L2. Then uh, Kriebel, Knapek, Bung, Kriebel and Knapek, they could prove that um, asymptotic approximation rate, so here's a little misprint, it should be uh, some constant is here missing. This decays like m to the power minus one. So it, we have the same integrability in source and target space. 
and our rate is in some sense dominated by the difference between the smoothness between source and target space. Later, uh, Din, Din Sung and Tino Ulrich, they had a look on the problem where now they deal with general smoothness in the source space, but they restricted to the periodic case and they don't look for sampling, they really look to approximation numbers and they proved that this quantity decays asymptotically like m to the power mixed smoothness minus isotropic smoothness. Um, one should say this work I mentioned here, here they really were considering the asymptotic constants which are behind this here, behind this similarity. So they were interested how these constants depend on the dimension of the underlying domain. Later, um, with some co-authors, we had a look on the situation which is closely related to the first one. So we um, allowed um, arbitrary smoothness in the target space and arbitrary but higher smoothness in the source space, restricted but still to the Hilbert cases. And we could prove that the sampling number also behaves in this case like m to the power minus r minus gamma. Finally, um, Din Sung um, looked to this problem for so-called Bezov spaces or spaces with bounded mixed differences. And he turned out that if one has some difference in integrability, so target space, integrability two, source space where the functions we want to approximate come from, integrability p, then we have a rate where we have the difference, uh, where we have as a power minus the difference between the mixed smoothness and the isotropic smoothness. And additionally, we have to pay a price for the difference in the integrabilities. And this holds for R being sufficiently large, so larger than gamma and gamma plus uh, this quantity here. And here we also need that R has to be bigger than a half and gamma. Okay. And maybe I should mention uh, some not unpublished result. It uh, was created during my PhD time and maybe, yeah, okay, it's published in my PhD thesis. If we look on the same problem for Zobolev spaces, so which are the focus for today, then we could prove that if we look to sampling numbers, functions come from Sobolev space of mixed smoothness. We want to measure the error in space um, with one derivative measured in L2. Then this error behaves very similar to this case where, which I mentioned for the space of setting. And, but with the restriction in my dissertation, I proved this only for R being so for smoothness being smaller than something due to the fact that I used for approximation the so-called Faber-Schauder system, which, which has a very restricted regularity. What all of these results have in common is that there is no d-dependence in the power of our rates, like it is the case um, if there is no isotropic smoothness in the source space, uh, in the target space, sorry. So remember if we had, this result on approximation numbers, where we had here L infinity, there we had always such additionally some log M to the power D. And this is here not the case in this energy setting. All these results on this last slide have in common that they are based on something which is called energy hyperbolic cross approximation. Meaning one describes a function in terms of um, some series and one is cutting off the series in terms of some energy hyperbolic cross. So in an, in an set which fulfills such a structure here. So where one has a J1 norm, which we know from the definition of Sobolev spaces of mixed smoothness from the weight and here such an infinity term, which 
uh, I will say later where we get the idea where it comes from. So for example, for so-called wavelet series expansions, I will explain on the next slide, we uh, truncate the, the wavelet series within such a sequence set, and this will yield us such a weight without an additional logarithmic term, where m is approximately the number of the wavelet coefficients used for this approximate. Okay, I told you I want to tell you something about wavelets. What are wavelets? So wavelets, um, we consider two functions, psi minus one and psi from L2. And um, if we consider the set over all JK, whereas um, this psi JK are defined as deletions and translations of this psi function, and psi minus one of k is simply translation of this minus one fun function, then this system of function has the property that they form an autonormal base in L2. What does it mean? It means that any function of f, uh, any function f in L2 gets an unconditional representation by its wavelet series expansion, this here in L2, and additionally, we get um, some Parseval identity for the norm in L2 provided by this summing up the Fourier coefficient, summing up the wavelet coefficient, square sum up the wavelet coefficients gives us equivalent norm in L2 for functions f. So these are wavelets. In this talk, we look on a special kind of wavelets, namely so-called Dobbushy wavelets. Dobbushy wavelets were probably the first construction that allowed to combine the property of a wavelet that it has compact support. And you can construct every arbitrary but finite smoothness for this wavelet. So um, Mrs. Dobbushy got famous for this construction in the early 90s or late 80s. So and to use this Dobbushy wavelets in connection with Zobolev spaces of dominating mixed smoothness, we take again some tensorized wavelets. So we have some vector j, which is d-dimensional, including uh, minus one in the, uh, as, uh, as extended uh, region for the natural numbers, and k being some integer vector or, yeah, with sign, then we tensorize our wavelets by simply uh, multiply this univariate ones um, with these different levels to each other. Jan Rubiral proved during his PhD time in 2005 that these wavelets allow a characterization of Sobolev spaces with mixed smoothness if they fulfill uh, if this uh, Dobbushy wave, so wavelets are scale of wavelets. So you have different parameters um, influencing in the end support, smoothness, and something which is called vanishing moment conditions. And if all your wavelets behave sufficiently fine for given P and given R and given D, then um, the Sobolev space of mixed smoothness fractional smoothness can be characterized as all these functions that allow a wavelet series expansion by um, this Dobbushy wavelets. And we obtain an equivalent norm by summing up the wavelet coefficients together with some characteristic function. I will say something on the next slide to it. Square sum the whole thing with this weight and measuring the whole thing in LP. And short notation for this is simply we measure the wavelet, the wavelet coefficients of our function f in some function sequence space, which we denote by SRPW. So this, for this characteristic function, this characteristic function, which was here inside of this norm, is simply the characteristic function of the unit interval and take this uh, dilated and translated 
version of it. And finally, take again the well-known tensor product construction of it. Okay. Let's state first observation concerning um, approximation numbers for this energy setting, which we could prove in this current joint work is that if we have integrability in the source space, and which is smaller than integrability in the target space, and both are on one side of the two, so and we either smaller than two or bigger than two, uh, or we are in case that Q is smaller than P. In this case, and additionally, we have fulfilled for the smoothness that the isotropic smoothness is not zero. Additionally, our mixed smoothness is bigger than the isotropic smoothness plus this, this difference in the integrabilities. Then we could prove this general weight now in the non-Hilbert space setting for Zobolev space with P, with integrability P into isotropic Zobolev space with integrability Q gives you the rate m to the power minus r minus this difference in the integrabilities minus the smoothness of the target space. So um, the lower bound is not really something um, special. It's, it was obtained by a univariate sequence space argument, which was already given by Rubiral, I think in 2007 or something like this. So look at the picture, what does it mean? Here we have a picture describing the approximation numbers for this embedding. On this line, we have the integrabilities of the source space where the functions come from we want to approximate. On this line, we have the quotient of the integrabilities of our target space. So then we have in this upper triangle here, which is a situation where Q is smaller or equal than P, in this case, we have that um, m to the power r minus gamma is optimal. So in this case, where we have uh, either in this upper triangle or in this lower triangle here, there we have to pay um, this uh, difference in the integrabilities, which is sharp. What is not uh, clear for the moment is what is happening in this right uh, lower triangle. In case of classical LQ approximation, let's say univariate, uh, so we don't have to speak about some logarithmic terms or something like this, with smoothness zero here, this here some special effects occur, namely that either P or Q gets stuck at two. So one gets a little bit better rate than it's the case here. And what is not clear for the moment is that such weight is also happening for this energy approximation setting. But I would tr uh, believe that this is happening and is work in progress in the moment. So this thing to compute the um, this approximation numbers or later best M-time approximation, I will show to you is based on discretization into comparable sequence spaces. We had already stated this type of sequence spaces. And the problem that appears is that, as I already told you, during the definition of isot fractional, isotropic and fractional mixed spaces, both use different resolution of unities for that definition. And the same would happen if you use wavelet isomorphisms to describe the spaces. So classically, the wavelets used for to discretize fractional Sobolev spaces are different from this you use for mixed spaces. For mixed spaces, you use tensor product constructions, whereas for isotropic spaces, you use seriously, a seriously devariate so-called multi-resolution analysis. And just recently, Schäfer, Ulrich, and Wedel, they proved that if we, P is between one and 
between one and infinity. And if our wa our Dobbyshu wavelets have nice properties, sufficiently sufficiently, sufficiently smooth, sufficiently many um, vanishing moments. In this case, we can also use the tensor product Dobbyshu wavelets to characterize isotropic smoothness. And with the difference, then here we have a weight with infinite, an infinity norm, the supremums norm. Whereas for this uh, mixed spaces, we had here one norm. And remember this infinity that came in the, in, that we saw in the index set, we, I mentioned, which deals for truncation of this series expansion. Inter interesting fact here is that in general, for spaces which are not Zobolev spaces, let's say for base of spaces with um, p, e, p uh, q not equal to two, in this case, such a representation fails. So we cannot get you, you don't get equivalent representation of isotropic base of spaces in case or by this hyperbolic wavelet series. Okay. The point is this theorem allows us to compare um, or to use comparable wavelet sequence bases for both spaces, for mixed smoothness and for isotropic smoothness. And this is in some sense the key of the matter. So, um, what I told you up to now was linear approximation, mm, meaning approximation where we had always some fixed linear subspace where the approximates came from. In practice, one very often has not to deal with a whole regularity class of functions or something like this. One has one single instance of a problem. For example, consider some globus of the world and this globus has some hate information in it. The world has a surface about 510 million square kilometers, and now you are interested in what are big areas, then, or which are very high areas. Then you recognize, oh, it is Himalaya area. Himalaya area has around 600 million square kilometers, which is zero around 0.1 percent of um, the surface of the world. But in this 600 million or in this 0.1%, you have more than, let's say, 10 mountains which are over 8,000 meters high, or more than 400 peaks which are bigger than 6,500 meters. And Probably with some mesh you put on your globus for approximation, it would even it would not even see this 0.1% of this uh, of the surface. So there could be for practical application the wish for some adaptivity. So you have sensitive areas where you want to spend some higher resolution, and you have areas where you don't need much resolution, for example, the sea, which is simply flat if you consider the surface of it, not under over water or something like this. And to benchmark this adaptivity or nonlinear methods, there is a concept called best M-term approximation. You have some dictionary, um, which is part of your target space. And the best M-term approximation is defined as you approximate uh, any function belonging to the unit ball from your source base by the best linear combination consisting of m functions for, or by a linear combination of m functions from your dictionary and measure the whole thing in your target space. So uh, the dictionary is simply the set of so-called m terms from the dictionary and we want to consider the dictionary of Dobbyshu wavelets. So we put in our dictionary all that compactly support Dobbyshu wavelets, which have a non-vanishing support in zero, one. And for this, 
dictionary, we want to consider now energy approximation. Before, let me mention some result from Sickle and Hansen. They considered a best M-term approximation for simply measuring errors in RQ. And what they get is that for P, P and Q between one and infinity, maybe even so, I forgot to allow Q equals infinity, and some R being sufficiently large, they get a rate M to the power minus one log D M to the R. To the R. So here, as before, where we measured uh, here without isotropic smoothness, one has a d-dependent logarithm. But the point is that this result here, the rate does not depend on the integrability between source and target space. And what we show is that such an effect also transfers to the energy setting where we measure our approximation error in a, ray, in a room with isotropic derivatives. So more precisely, we have a isotropic smoothness, which is seriously bigger than zero. We have R being bigger than isotropic smoothness plus some difference in integrability. Under these circumstances, we can give a constructive method which realizes this rate. And it's not possible to find a method which, give, which gives you an asymptotically better rate. Um, the interesting point is here we combine two effects. Namely, we have this poorly polynomial rate which we know from, any, from linear energy sampling. Additionally, we have this effect um, we have seen by Sickle and Hansen that there is no influence to the approximation rate uh, in sense of the integrabilities of the considered spaces. So um, let me tell you something about the constructive method used to obtain um, this um, M-term. Assume you have some function f belonging to a Zobolev space with mixed smoothness, um, belonging to its unit ball, and we have the idea to build an M-term approximation by a simple truncation of the so-called wavelet series expansion to M active summons. Um, the wavelet isomorphism allows us to identify the function f belonging to the unit ball with the, a sequence of wavelet coefficients inside of some wavelet sequence space, and we can control its norm. Interestingly, Due to the fact that, um, as we have already seen from this um, result of approximation numbers, the embedding from the mixed um, sequence space into the isotropic Sobolev space is a compact embedding. This means if we consider the a, a truncated wavelet series expansion where we cut off some wavelet levels, and measure this whole thing in some W gamma space. Then um, this can be represented due to this uh, theorem by uh, Schäfer, Wedel, Ulrich, I've mentioned, by um, such uh, sequence space in our isotropic or in, in our wavelet function space dealing with isotropic smoothness. And due to the fact we know this that this whole thing is finite, if we make L sufficient large, then this so-called remainder term here becomes small. What does it mean for us? If we aim for finding an M term of our wave of our function, then we don't have to know or we don't need knowledge 
of the full wavelet series expansion. The wavelet series expansion for a general function is something infinite. There cannot be a constructive method to, um, to get this. So, but what we see from this remainder estimate is that we have to look only to, or we have to approximate only a finite part of this wavelet series expansion due to the fact that the error of the remaining thing is sufficient small due to the compact embedding. Um, this means it's sufficient for us to construct a nice M term, which approximates the first uh, L levels sufficiently well. So, um, and we you take the following decomposition of our wavelet series expansion. So F has a wavelet series expansion and we put this wavelet series expansion into such energy hyperbolic layers. So we put, here we have a sum over mu. Mu describes here any of one of these lines and um, J or this, this a mu, the set of a mu are the number of dots between these lines. And um, what we take is here for fixed mu, we sum up all deletions and translations of wavelet coefficients together with wavelets, which are inside of, or which are between two of these lines. So the classical result of Hansen where approximation in LP or LQ was considered. They used a decomposition of their index sets in so-called hyperbolic uh, layers. And we had to modify this to this kind of so-called energy layers. So here we had this part, which, which has very big L, which gives you already due to compact embedding, small error. We don't need to approximate this part. This is the error, which this generates a small. We want to approximate only this part. So, and the idea is now go to any of these layers here and take a prescribed number of the biggest coefficients in these layers. And the point is that any fixed level in this layer has to be weighted differently. It is weighted by two to the R minus one over P J one. So in the classical construction of, of Hansen and Sickel, they had any point of this line was equally weighted. And here, any of these points between the lines gets an individual weight. And after it's weighted, they are compared. And then you take from any of these layers here, the mu biggest coefficients and this mu are cleverly chosen such that they sum up to m. And with this construction, you find an m term, which um, gives you the approximation rate mentioned in this theorem before. Um, if somebody's interested how to choose this, it's not that easy, but you find um, an archive, the preprint of this paper, probably I forgot to uh, reference it here. So I can tell you later if you, the title. Okay. Um, maybe to, for the end, let me mention Again, this uh, difference. So now uh, this end is not about energy sampling or an energy approximation anymore. I simply want to tell you again this difference between linear and nonlinear approximation and the different in the convergence rate. For that purpose, we consider the square root function in zero one, this function. So if we would approximate this function from some, let's say, by equidistant knots. So, so some piecewise polynomial function with equidistant knots in k over n. Then we can show that this function, uh, sorry, 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 too much. So here, um, gets, um, this is also the verse. Um, 
Okay, it's not good what I have written here. Um, okay, there are different strategies. One slide is missing. Um, first one, equidistant knots. For equidistant knots, we get a rate for this approximation problem of one over square root n. So if we would use another strategy, namely put the variation this function is doing into equal pieces. So here we had uh, the definition domain in, in equidistant pieces and we take for this function, um, we put this function, the variation of this function into uh, equ equidistant pieces. And which means now that our approximation space is adapted to our function, then we get a rate one over two n. So it means uh, an approximation rate one over n, um, where the error is measured L infinity, meaning this nonlinearity for this helps us. So we have now a special subspace where the approximate comes from, which is somehow adapted to our function, and this helps us. So actually, we can show that um, even more is, more is possible. Then, for example, um, from, yeah, let's say in the end theory, which was done in my dissertation or by Hansen and Sickel, one can also, if one looks at the second derivative of the square root function, then we see that if we would measure uh, the second derivative in LP, where now P is between uh, smaller than two thirds, then this becomes bounded. This does not really make sense to explain it in terms of Zobolev spaces um, due to missing little bit pay you and so on, but at least in the end, it would make sense to explain what it means in sense of base of regular spaces. Um, so we obtain that for sacrifice, for a very small integrability, we get a high regularity. And the point is now, from this, with nonlinear method, we can even conclude that our square root function can be approximated by some freely chosen approximation knots with a rate of n to the power minus two. And what I wanted to describe is we one can benefit from this kind of non-compact embeddings. So consider or think first you deal with a function where you consider um, smoothness in sense of measuring it in L2. So a space which is uh, continuously embedded in this space is, is uh, this space here. So where the so-called fractional difference is uh, bigger than here. So we make P smaller, we sacrifice integrability, but can obtain a little bit more smoothness. And if we have the effect that our exact function, function we want to approximate even belongs to this space, then we can uh, improve our approximation rate from this additional smoothness we have here due to the fact that linear a nonlinear approximation only sees the difference in um, smoothness between source and target space. Whereas linear approximation, you always have to pay the difference between integrabilities between source and target space where you measure your error. Okay, that's all. Um, I should mention to the end that all these results are also available for general Bezov and trivial Zorkin spaces, at least as the source space in the target space we have some problem due to this uh, theorem by Wiedel Schäfer Ulrich I mentioned. And additionally, we dealt in um, the paper where this talk was based on actually with hybrid type smoothness, meaning we have simultaneously from the functions we, in, in the functions we want to approximate um, some hybrid smoothness component and some dominating mix smoothness component, as it was shown in the first example where we considered this uh, Isarent Hunt result. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you, Glenn.